Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Uh, Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done hundreds of them now. Um, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. And there's also a page uh, that explains alternatives to PayPal. Um, and if you feel like it, subscribe to the podcast on YouTube. Um, YouTube sort of gives you more preferential treatment if you have more subscribers. <clears throat> and then you'll be notified when uh, these things go online. And there's also a way to get notified through the website by email. My guest today is Elizabeth Ann Hill. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Elizabeth nice is to be over. Here. Oh, yeah, it's good to have you. Elizabeth is over in the UK at the moment, but as you will hear, she's been rather itinerant through the last many years of her life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, she says that her spiritual journey began in October 2002 um, with the death of her identical twin sister, Catherine Mary Hill, who um, was in an on-duty vehicle accident as a U.S. Border Patrol agent along the U.S.-Mexico border. Before Kathy died, she had learned about a grand spiritual awakening taking place across the planet, which she tried to share with Elizabeth with no success. After Kathy's yeah. death, Elizabeth began to have contact with Kathy in dreams and through many psychic mm -hmm. mediums. She discovered that she and Catherine had come in as social change agents and that they had made a pact to work together to deliver this important information to the world. Catherine assisted Elizabeth in writing her first book, um, Twin Souls, which I'll hold up here, A Message of Hope for the New Millennium. <clears throat> um, through this process, Elizabeth developed strong intuitive gifts and connection with non-physical realms. In 2008, during a session with a group of spirit guides via trance channel Glenna Dietrich, Elizabeth was told about a new project they would create together called An Interview with the Universe, which would include Q&A, an experiential traveling journey, and another book. Elizabeth's journey would entail letting go of all traditional safety nets, including job, income, and home, to travel the world with nothing but her intuitive connection with her sister and her infinite self. The guides explained that the purpose of the journey was to transmute the limiting belief systems and fears surrounding money for herself and for all of humanity. After she undertook this journey, she would be ready for the changes that would occur in the world, and at the right moment, she would be called upon to teach and share the wisdom she had gained. Now, in 2020, with all that is occurring on the world stage, now is that moment. So... There we go. For sure. <laughs> um, and I also have been, you know, as many people have, been ant anticipating something like this um, yeah. for many decades. And, you know, it kind of seems like it's really picking up steam now. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And not by any mistake either. No. Yeah. I think we we both discussed uh, earlier and agreed that nothing happens by mistake. No. Which could seem like a harsh statement, you know? I mean, horrible things happen to people um, individually and collectively, you know, and, you know, it, it confuses people. They think, well, if, is this a mistake? Or if it is a mistake, how could God allow mistakes like this to happen? And do mistakes happen? And they, they get into these philosophical quandaries, yeah. you know, when life really throws a monkey wrench in the works for them. Yeah, well, I mean, there's just, they need to learn about a little more deeply into who and what they are and a little more deeply into the idea of soul contracts and that when we talked about this and we can probably talk about it more about how we come into our body with a plan and that we actually come into this realm intentionally to take on deep, deep emotions and challenges in this third dimension because it's kind of all a dream, an illusion, and we take on challenges so that the soul can grow and expand and it's an adventure and we want to do it but it's it is there are very deep challenges for a lot of people and what they don't see is the meaning if they saw the meaning the deep meaning behind it of why they wanted to have that experience then they would 
it would be much, much easier for them to understand. Yeah. So let's probe into that a little bit. Um, you know, we know that all kinds of horrible things happen to people. Um, they are born with deformities or mental problems or, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, they get shot accidentally or they get, you know, obviously there are huge events like the Holocaust and so on. So people would ask, why in the heck would anybody sign up for that? I don't remember signing up for that. I don't think I signed up for that. How can it, it almost seems like you have to sort of um, think about it deeply in, in order to have that make sense to you, or at least many people would have to think about it deeply. So let's help them with that. Well, you know, people don't know. This is the thing they become when we come into this realm, we intentionally take on a veil of forgetfulness of who we really are as this infinite soul, infinite, one with all that is being. And we we forget that intentionally because we want to, otherwise, if we remembered that, there wouldn't be all this learning, right? So some souls are very, um, what's the word? They're very ambitious when they're not in their body. Because when you're not in your body, you're much more expanded as a being. And you like, oh yeah, I want to take this on. I want to learn this. I want to learn that. And then when you come into the body, we forget all of this, but there's something inside of us deeply that knows. I mean, when I lost a twin, and I can talk more about this later or whatever, but I lost my identical twin sister. And almost immediately after it happened, bells were ringing in the back of my consciousness. Everybody was grieving. I mean, I was grieving, of course, but I knew, I knew it was like, I already knew that she was going to go. And then what's more devastating than losing an identical twin. But I knew in my consciousness, there's a huge story behind this and I just felt it. And I got downloads of communication for the first time about, you know, your sister Kathy is fine. And remember what she was doing and reading before reading and doing and saying before she passed, uh, because she had a spiritual awakening right before she passed. And she was trying to communicate this to me. And I went, you know, what are you talking about? You know, but so we have these soul agreements, we have soul contracts, and then we also have to understand the physics of this universe is, um, well, first of all, you have to know who you are. You have to sit in contemplation and ask that quint- that, that essential question, who am I really? That has to inform your entire life completely. Can that and question be have- answered in words? I would say more than likely you might get a few words in your mind, but it's, it's experiential. Yeah. And the more you ask and the more you sit in that, the more it connects your entire being. And this is what is happening. This is why we are being pushed so hard because so many people are focused outward on this world and everything in it, instead of focusing inward, which is the whole reason we're here is to remember who we really are. And then there's also the laws of physics, which is the law of attraction, energy, vibration, using your divine self, which is your connection with your divine self, but also using the principles of this universe to play a game, to create what you want to create. And as part of that creation, there are intentional contrasts because you see what you don't want. You see who you're not so that you know what you do want and what you, what you are. And some of them are pretty deep because at this time of this awakening that's happening, every, every fear, every judgment from every incarnation has to come up and be transmuted and all these separated parts of ourselves have to come back into wholeness. And so it's a big moment in, and there's a big choice that we have to make. Are we going to do this journey inward? And are we going to learn more about who we really are and how things really work here? Or are we just going to continue to allow ourselves to be in victim mode and, and uh, so that's the choice we're making right now. Very mm. important. Yeah. Yeah. Every say every sentence you speak gives rise to a question in my mind. So uh, I'll just kind of pick certain Fire ones as we, as we go along. <laughs> that's uh, fun for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think one thing that's implicit in everything we've said so far is that, um, well, we, we've kind of already covered this, but that, that nothing happens by accident, that there's an intelligence that permeates and orchestrates the universe mm-hmm. and yes. that it doesn't miss a beat. I mean, it's, it's, maybe we can talk a little bit about that intelligence. In fact, when you get into telling your life story about how you've been traveling around the world sort of on a wing and a prayer, um, 
that bring, that raises some really interesting questions about the mechanics of how things would just work out for a person uh, in the nick of time and all. I, I want maybe you should may, continue telling your own story a bit, and, and then we'll get into that whole thing about how you traveled around, and okay. um, and that'll and we'll yes. we'll go into the whole discussion of. So you, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so you want me to start with like my twin sister, or just start at the beginning, or just keep talking? Well, we've we already talked about. about Catherine dying and how that kind of kickstarted your spiritual quest. And right. you discovered this whole cache of books and emails and so on that you hadn't been aware of. Um, and you started to really plunge into that. And it was a real it, it, beginning of a huge education for you. Yes. And I was communicating with her. And then I began communicating with beings of other consciousnesses, such as what we would, what we in human form would call masters and and angelic presence and how did you communicate with them what was what was that well there was dreams of and the one thing was dreams i mean the dreams were so vivid i was having all these blue lights and because i'm very connected with archangel michael which is blue and my sister was her symbol was blue butterflies and blue angels so there was all this blue and then i was hearing names like jesus and paramahansa yogananda and i mean really like there was something and then i was told there's a message there's a message and you're the one to deliver the message and your sister's helping you. I mean, all of this is going on in dreams. And then also I was guided to certain psychic mediums who all said the same thing, that you are here because of this awakening and you wanted to use that energy for yourself and for everyone else to clear out all the old energy that wouldn't serve humanity anymore. And so that, and also through meditation and, you know, direct connection, I, I can, as time has gone, I'm able to, I have all those different like knowing and feeling and seeing and sensing and it as a part of my daily life. And I can hear, it's not really hearing, it's kind of more like our ideas and, and hearing somebody say something almost like, and then, you know, I can feel when I'm a Pisces, so I can, you know, I can feel if one hair is out of place, I can feel it. So I'm very feeling oriented and I also just know things and I don't know how I know them. And I just knew, I just know that, that the things from, and I was told this by these, well, we'll get to later, the group of guides that came in about how I came in with this knowing that the old ways were not going to work anymore. And so that was my, my part of this is to demonstrate a new way of understanding and being not really new. It's quite old actually, but um, we've forgotten it. So after my sister passed and I had all this communication, uh, I was guided to quit my job. I started receiving guidance and I just kept getting quit my job. So I did quit my job. And so I thought, when you say you were guided, I mean, a lot of people feel like eh, this job sucks. I'd like to quit it. <laughs> and should they regard that as guidance? <laughs> um, you, the, the, the key is you have to know yourself. You know the saying, know thyself. You have to know yourself so well that you have to know, is this, if I'm having a challenge or something, is this a soul expanding challenge that I want to stay with? Or is there something I need to do differently? And I just knew, and also I was hearing it, you know, it's time to let go of the old, you have something else to do. And so I didn't, I thought, well, okay, I'll get my master's degree. And I signed up and everything. And that helped me to quit my job. But in the end, there was going to be no, no master's degree. The universe was like, eh, no. <laughs> there's something else so i started doing my own podcast just like what you do and uh, it's contact talk radio you may have heard of them and i started doing my own interviewing authors and i had written this book twin souls a message of hope for the new millennium with my twin sister helping me and all these other consciousnesses coming in and so i was kind of promoting that and then um i really didn't know well, what am i because money was going away going away going away and i'm like well okay this is nice, but what, how am I, what, you know, what am I going to do? And so I just kept getting this internal guidance about become like a child, become like a child, let go of trying to figure anything. Cause I tried, I mean, when people read the book, they're going to laugh at some of the things I tried to do once I realized, Oh, cause I, I kind of thought, well, I'll publish this book and I'll be a famous author and that's how I'll have money. Right. But it was not, that was not, I mean, Maybe later they said the guides that I met, which we'll speak about in a minute, but they said, yes, this will be a widely read book, but that's not how it's going to happen. So I thought, well, what am I supposed to do? So finally, I took this advice because there was nothing. 
There was nothing else. And so go play, find the joy that you felt as a child. And so everybody's at work. And I, I was in my forties at the time. So I'm a 40 year old person. I'm on the beach, you know, boogie boarding in the ocean and swimming and running. And then I went to ballet class, you know, ballet is my great dance and ballet my sister and my great love of our life. And I did that. And I did, I did a silent retreat at uh, Paramahansa Yogananda's uh, self-realization center, which he was a big influence in the early part of my journey. And after that, my father had passed away in 2006 and his estate was in a mess and he didn't have a will. I told him to get one, but he, he was one of those types. He didn't listen. And so um, it was not supposed to settle for like a year. And then all of a sudden, bam, it settled right after I did that time period of just being like a child. And so some money came and I got myself a place right near the ocean, right near the self-realization fellowship, which I love so much. And everything came in. And Glenna, that's when I met a woman by the name of Glenna Dietrich. And that started me on a whole new direction. Did you want me to keep going or? Um, yeah, no, you're doing good. So, um, and Glenna was a trance channel. And yeah, uh, it was. I listened to uh, uh, that, what is it called? Um, An interview with the universe. Right. I listened to that series with you and Glenna and you, you sat, you sat on, well, you can tell the story, how you sat on the beach and elsewhere and like came up with like 250 questions and yeah. um, you're asking Glenn all these things. Um, go ahead, continue for now. Well, Okay, so I was doing my own radio show, and I interviewed an author by the name of Robert Schwartz, who you had on the show, amazing, amazing book called Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift, and it's all about the plan that we make before we come into our body, the challenges that we want to take on, the people that we're, we may or may not meet, depending on how well we learn and all of this, and I was just so intrigued by that. It just really got me excited because I felt like there's so much more to this life than what meets the eye. So... Not through him, though, through somebody else. This is how synchronicities work in my life. I met Glenna Dietrich. This man was promoting psychics and mediums on a website, and he asked me if I would have readings with these different mediums so that I could say, were they real or not real? And so one of them was Glenna Dietrich, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's Glenna Dietrich from the book, you know, Your Soul's Plan. And so we had this long session together. She's, she, she has passed away in 2009, but she is an absolutely amazing, wise happy-go-lucky, just all the beautiful things of being human and also being very wise. And in the session, we, we, we had this long, she used astrology and Akashic records and everything. And then in the end, she said, okay, now we're going to do a channeling. And it's not going to be me. It's going to be these guides coming through to speak. And they came and they spoke to me and it was really profound. And then they said, do you want to ask questions? And I was, oh, wow, I get to ask questions. And I was kind of flustered and I asked a couple and then it was done and I uh, I couldn't stop thinking about this because I am question I have so many questions and so I just couldn't stop thinking and so finally I asked her again Glenna could we do that part again uh, I, I really want to do it again and she said well normally I don't it takes a lot of energy but I'm I'm being compelled that I should say yes so during that second channeling these guides came in and said we highly recommend that you do what you have thought of you know um well, let me back up. So I was going to have this second channeling with Glenna and I was writing out my questions, you know, I was so excited on the beach, writing out my questions. And then I got this lightning bolt, like a book title, an interview with the universe. I thought, oh, that's so exciting because, you know, I had a radio show and I had always wanted a really big guest on my show. I'm like, well, what's bigger than the universe? So it was so great. So I told her and she got very excited because she said she'd always wanted to use her gifts in a bigger way. So I was able to, at this time I had, the money was just, I had no money. I, I don't, I was just skimming along, but something in my, this little voice reminded me about some credit card points that I had. So I was able with those credit card points to book a trip to Minneapolis where she was. And we were going to do this interview with the universe where I would ask the questions. She would be in a trance state and the guides would speak through her to me. And then it would eventually would become a book and right and all uh, that's on youtube and I, I could even add a link to that in the show notes yes, um did you ever did. write the book well I'm, I'm, I'm writing i writing am it writing now. it it's I, my books are very long the first one took five years now it's i'm going on 12 yeah. i don't write short books but it's 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 
it's the, the evolving process is stunning. Yeah. And so it's not ready to be written. It's not ready to be completed, but I am writing it as I go along. So the stuff in the book yeah. is more than than came out in you, in the interview with Glenna. It's more. Oh, it's way more. Massively, massively, massively more. That was just starting point. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so we want to talk about that at some point. Um, your new book and yes. what's in it. But we also want to talk about how your life proceeded after this and how you ended yeah. up just sort of like traveling to 20 countries in the world, you know, um, for, I don't know how many years you did this, but, you know, 12, 12 years oh. without any reliable source of income um, and th- often sort of down to your last dollar and things would always just keep working out. And yeah. it's kind of worth telling that story, I think, to really get to know you. Well, so we, we had a channeling sessions that were not part of that the public recordings and in those recordings the guides we just called them the guides you know in 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 one of the sessions they they said we're not going to say who we are on the public because humans get too caught up and you know who is it and all of this but they said it's the it's the brotherhood it's a white brotherhood or the brotherhood of light which is also known as um, the Christ Council or the Council of Elders or whatever, but they, the guiding the earth and also the angelic realm. Um, so, but, and they said the cosmic sources that you couldn't even imagine in your human mind are involved in this. And they said, what you're going to be doing, they kept alluding to a journey and they said, it, it's going to take enormous courage. They just kept saying that enormous courage. And in fact, you're going to face the deepest fears of all of humanity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, what am I going to be doing? It was really like, okay. You know, I just, I had this sense in me. I'm very, I have a very strong will. So I was like, okay. <laughs> they said, but when you come out the other side of it, you are going to be ready for what's going to happen in the world. And you're going to be able to help other people. And you will be a, a profound teacher because you, you, you've done this experientially. I said, mm. okay. Are you out the other so, side now or are you still traveling and sort of? Oh, um, I mean, out the other side, meaning walking through the deepest fears, the deepest fears part seems, seems to have, um, moved out but uh, no i have no idea like i only have two weeks where i'm at now and have no idea what's after that and no money to back me up so um (laughs) i did that when i was a teenager (laughs) yeah well yeah but it's so i mean but that's just it's it's commonplace to me it doesn't cause any at all but so but as far as like what i learned there would be a moment where i would be as i'm doing right here turning around and sharing the wisdom so that people who started to have their own seeming security might be falling away what 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 they can do yeah so, and, and just obviously that's happening people might be watching this interview five or ten years from now but obviously we're in the midst of the covid 19 pandemic and oh, mm-hmm. the rug is being pulled out from under yes. a lot of people you know they've absolutely they've and, and I was you told- don't really hear the, the, the full story on the news because the news gives you sound bites but there are millions of people out there who are really in dire straits and uh, yeah with a great deal of fear and, and, and uncertainty and that's, that's what the guide said they kept saying you were going to be ready for what's going to happen in the world and there were many people who would be absolutely terrified when this happens but you will not be mm-hmm but I had to go through a lot of things to get to that point. Believe me. Yeah. Um, but you kind of but did the dress rehearsal. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I mean, and but the thing is, I, I want to reassure everyone that you're not going to take on the level of intensity that I did because these guides said you intentionally took the most intense, packed journey that you could. That's just your personality that you came in with. <laughs> So you may have some challenges, but it's not going to be when when I start describing. Some, if I describe some of them later. Don't worry, you're probably not going to do that. But in your own way, you need to, well, you'll need to start understanding these things more deeply about who you are and how that that actually supplies you. And how do I, I can go into more depth about how I used the physics of this universe to bring about what I what I needed. Yeah, but, we'll get into um, that. But, I was on I was on a boat ride in on Lake Lucerne in Switzerland in 1975 I think it was and oh. with Marshi Mahesh Yogi and a bunch of people oh. and he he was talking about this time that is seems to yeah. be here now which he called the phase transition and he used various analogies from physics about phase transition such as when water oh. boils and things like that um, but in any case someone said to him how can we survive that and he just said 
hold on to the self. That is, and that's it. Yeah. That's it. And that's how I did it. And that's how I've survived facing the deepest fears of all of humanity by myself and across the world in non-English speaking countries. And, yeah. yeah, yeah Myanmar and, on to the, and places like that. Oh God. Held on to the South. Um, but also know the laws of physics in this, in this universe, which we can talk about. Mm-hmm. But, um, so I was told that it was going to be doing this and then, so we did the interview with the universe and I came back to San Diego, which is where I'm from. And then a very short time later, because my father, I told you my father's estate had settled and I had some money, but it came a point in time in 2008 when all that money was gone. And I, I, I'm like, what am I going to do? Is this, is this what's going to happen to me? I'm going to be homeless in my car. Is this what these guides were talking about? But I, I somehow I felt, no, is there's something else, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And I was walking on the beach and just praying and praying and praying, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. <laughs> and it just was closer and closer and closer to the time when I had to pay my rent and I couldn't pay it. And I kept getting this little small, in my mind's eye, this woman who had asked me to come counsel her daughter because her daughter had this friend committed suicide. And she knew that I knew about all this stuff. It's interesting. And, I just want to interject here. Um, it's interesting that you were asking the question, tell me what to do, because a lot of people would just say, okay, who, here, what do I have to do? All right. Well, I have to get a job or I have to do this and um, have to you know, find a cheaper place to live. Or so they, would, they wouldn't be asking anybody what they should do. They would just be sort of well, assuming there was no one to ask and kind of just making decisions as best they could. But you, you just had this pretty solid sense that Oh yeah, Th- that there was some guidance if you asked for it. I, I wouldn't be able to survive what I came in to do without that. So, right. and the other thing is, I did. I would sit for hours, print, you know, filling out applications for jobs, and then I would print it and would print blank. Huh. Like yeah. the universe, there was not. I had sometimes I had three jobs lined up; they all fell through. It was not happening. It was. I mean, people say you did this by choice. And, well, yeah, I guess, but I, there was <laughs> nothing that would stick to me. Nothing. Yeah. And I mean, I worked in corporate America. I mean, I, you know, I was very successful. I, I made the, you know, a lot of money in my early thirties for someone in their thirties. So, I mean, I, it wasn't that I didn't have the ability to work. So it was, there was, you know, this, and this was happening pretty much. Well, I had just met these guides through Glenna, but a lot of it was going on. We were kind of in between. I wasn't, hadn't really talked to Glenna, but I, I was connecting inwardly to these beings because if you listen to the interview in the beginning it says this is a receiving of information from you and by you yeah and i take that to mean my multi-dimensional self higher self you know but you know you had kristen kirk on the show she expressed it beautifully that there's the individual part it's the one infinite source takes on these different levels of soul and then individual personality etc yeah so i knew that this receiving of information was my own self and I just want to add that I've had, a, just to familiarize people, I mean, most of the people who watch this show are familiar with everything you're saying, right. but, but there might be, but I have interviewed actually people who, for, who would disagree with this whole worldview. And so if they do, then probably some of the listeners might, or it might not fit into their understanding. But, um, you know, I've, I've talked to a number of people who routinely perceive all kinds of subtle beings around us doing things and uh, you know some of which may have to do with us some of which may not um like harry alto for instance or francis bennett or you know different people who just see this as routinely as we might see people walking through a shopping mall and um you know so there is this the, the basic concept you're alluding to here is there's more to life than meets the eye there are these subtler dimensions and the subtler dimensions whatever they're made of we could think of them as being sort of astral or celestial realms which are made of some astral celestial matter are highly populated <laughs> there's as many beings in those realms as there Huge. are on, on the surface yeah. realm that we perceive and we may not perceive them, but some of them or, or many of them perceive us and have and interact in ways that influence our lives. And that may be their actual function to influence our lives and to either assist or thwart our intentions according to how they align with cosmic purpose, we could say. Well, they, they wouldn't, they would never intervene and thwart, you know, we as human beings. And this is an argument that goes on and on about free will. But I was told by the guides, it is all about your free will in this realm. I mean, you have to understand that, you know, cause I got all caught up in the non-dual thing before too. 
and people try to negate the human part and the soul part, but it, it's just the one infinite source taking on different for its own expansion, bringing itself, you know, Kristen explained like, you know, there's just this oneness, there's this nothingness, and then it comes down into the soul level, then it comes down into each individual being. And so these beings that are guiding us, it's no different than you and I talking. They're just at a higher frequency. They're not, they're not even somewhere else. It's just that the human eye can't see them because they're vibrating at a higher rate of speed. And so they're, they're, they play, the guide said that we have like 12, sometimes 12 deep of different spirit guides throughout our life all the time. And they said that you don't, you can choose not to take the guidance. It's, you have complete free will and that your guides want you to make choices. And they said, it doesn't matter what choice just make one and then that'll be supported. <laughs> See how it goes, yeah. Well, I'll well, give you an example yeah. of thwart. Like for when I first started this show, I conceived of it as a radio show on this local little station here that has since gone out of business that has a, a 10 mile radius, had a 10 mile radius. Ah. And it was just no, you know, it seemed like a, a done deal. It was, this is a spiritual community I live in and they, they should be interested, but they weren't. And it was just meeting <laughs> with this opposition. And finally, when the idea shifted to doing it on a much larger scale, then total support started happening. Well, that's more of a redirect, it sounds like, you know, or like an expansion of what you started off. You know, it's just like me trying to get a job and it wasn't happening. Right, exactly. I would call that a Because it wasn't just... what it was supposed to happen. I mean, it was my own soul, which is me. It's mm -hmm. not something outside of me saying, you know, gently, gently nudging me. Because I could have kept filling out applications and I could have kept trying, you know, but I, I knew, no, this is not happening. So, but we have guidance and you get to choose whether you take it or not. When you, when you printed out a job application and the paper was blank, that was your own soul on some higher level causing the printer to malfunction? I guess. I don't know. I mean, something. It was just not happening. I yeah. mean, I tried. To be, it was a joke, some of the things that I tried to do. I mean, I laugh about it now, but at the time I was kind of afraid. Like, well, nothing is happening. What am I supposed to do? And <laughs> it was really scary. Yeah. And so people later on down the road, oh, you just don't want to work and you're just on this joyride. Oh, honey, you want to trade positions with me? <laughs> Yeah, really. It was very challenging. So, um, so I forgot where I was, but anyway, it's, um, yeah. So you had been invited by this woman to counsel yes. her daughter who had, whose friend had committed suicide. And so right. you didn't know what you were going to do, but you did that. I, I, I was, I was asking for guidance, repeatedly asking for guidance. And the only thing that kept coming was that. And so I went, I had at that, by that moment, I had no money, no food, no hardly any gas in my car, we call it petrol here in England, hardly any petrol in my car. And I said, well, I know because I had learned how to accept the guidance, even if it seems crazy. And also I learned about if you serve others, then you will be served. So I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And I drove the 40 minutes to this friend's house and I counseled the daughter and the, the friend had just had surgery. So she had a bunch of friends there. And so they all said, hey, do you have, I used to carry copies of my book around and they all bought copies of the book. So I got some money and they fed me lunch. So I ate. And then one of the women, she looked really familiar to me and she said, hey, I kind of told them what was going on. Like I'm about to be homeless. And, and she said, well, I'm going out of the country and I need a pet sitter and I love animals. So, and she said, you know, just move in with me. And I said, yeah, but I, I need a place right away. She's like, I don't care. I have an office. Let's go. So all in one day I was literally like homeless. And then this woman just popped up and because I followed the guidance, you see, it's like Hansel and Gretel follow the trail. And so we just, I just quickly, it would happen so fast. I just moved. That was the last place that I rented was this little adorable cottage in Encinitas right near the beach. And that was the last home. And that was in 2008. And so I, I, I moved in with this woman and she went out of the country and I petted her lovely animals. And then, you know, from there, I started hopping around with different friends who invited me, one in San Francisco. And then uh, I kept, I was with my friend in San Francisco, just visiting and staying with her. And then she was so worried. Oh my God, Elizabeth, you have to do something. You have to do something. And I kept saying to her, I'm going to get a phone call. I don't know how I knew, but I just knew. Well, sure enough, the phone call came and it was a man who I had met two, like a year ago, Glenna and I, when Glenna was alive, we had gone to this conference in Tennessee and presented the interview. And while we were there, I met a man and he was building a healing center in Tennessee. And he, I felt something at that time when I met him, 
he called out of the blue. How are you doing? I said, told him what was going on. He said, well, I have this healing center here that I'm building on this river. He said, it's not that completely done yet, but come here. And guess what the name of the town was? Elizabethton, Tennessee. <laughs> So, and so he said, I have, a, I, yeah. yeah. And he said, I have a car here that you can use a little car. So I had, I had no money, but I had my friend flew me back to San Diego because my car was there and all my stuff. And the same friend that whose daughter I counseled, she said, come stay with me. <clears throat> she fed me. I had $6 to my name. I bought a $6 car wash. I put my car on Craigslist and I had this premonition that in three days that car will sell and you'll be on a plane to Tennessee. That exact thing then happened. And I ended up in Elizabeth in Tennessee in this big, gorgeous home right on the river. And that's where it all kind of started in earnest because I would be down to no money all the time, all the time. And some neighbor would knock on the door with a big basket of food. So it didn't always come in money. In fact, often it didn't come in money. It would be a person that would offer something or food. And I was not the one controlling this, but I was using my intention, my energy, my, the skills of using the physics of this universe <laughs> to draw in to myself what I needed. So it wasn't passive. I, I tried there to get a job too. Again, nothing, you know, so everything just kept coming. And I was out in the country. It was this tiny little town. I knew nobody. And yet somehow Either money would show up or a person, but it was always something different. Yeah. And that's kind of how it all started. The, 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 the United States part of it anyway, it's where it all kind of began, where I started to see there is something here that is supporting me. Yeah. And, and um, you've, I've you know, listened to about five or more hours of other interviews and things you did. And, you know, we could spend this whole interview talking about all this yeah. amazing sort of um, synchronicities and supports yeah. that you received as you traveled around the world. Um, but since those are in other interviews, I want to be sure to save time for talking about some of the deeper principles that we want to talk about. But uh, although all this that you're describing is symptomatic of some deeper principle. Yeah. Um, but um, and feel free to bring in more anecdotes and stories like that. But uh, I just wanted to read. Later. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted. Yeah. To, you, you told me that a lot of people are reminded of this verse from the Bible, which we might as well read here. Um, you know, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? It's from Matthew 6, 25 through 27. And um, the reason I wanted to read that um, is that, again, I think that what you're describing is um, indicative of a, a deeper spiritual mechanics, which we've already talked about, the, the, the intelligence of the universe, call it God, if you like, um, who you know, attends to every lily of the field and every bird of the air and uh, takes care of them and can take care of us as well. Now, I've had some, I was just having an interesting conversation with a friend not long ago who was kind of arguing that it seems like animals are enlightened because they're so innocent and so in tune with nature and all that. And I was saying, no, we have to define enlightenment. And, and you know, that's a certain stage. And yes, they are very much in tune with nature. But as humans, we kind of go through a more intermediate stage where we're more like teenagers, you know, with our free will and getting ourselves into trouble. And enlightenment yeah. would be more of a mature stage than that, where we, mm -hmm. we regain the sort of innocence and attunement with nature of animals. And yet we have attained sort of the wisdom of a higher wisdom, a self-realization. So perhaps that'll give you a springboard to, to go into some things. Well, I don't agree that we are more important. I think that's a mistranslation or something, but you know, in that verse, they say, well, are, are, who knows? I don't, yeah. but anyway, not going into that, but um, I, I think animals are very enlightened in, in Robert Schwartz's book, your soul's gift. They say that, that animals uh, some animals are like really evolved beings and they don't want to go into the human drama. They don't, they don't want to take that. So they come as helpers, but you're, it's true that we have, we have the deep stuff. We have, you know, we have the veil of forgetfulness, whereas they don't, I think they're more direct in their connection with source. 
And because they just, you know, they just, they just are, they, they don't have the analytical, the past, the future and all this, they have emotions, you know, to a certain degree, but at any rate, um, you know, I lost my train of thought. So what was the well, question? We're talking about animals and, the, and their level of evolution and feel free to jump in as soon as you regain your train of thought. But, um, it's like, I think well, animals, one, one yeah. angle on it is that, um, it's like, where do you draw the line? As, as nervous systems become more complex, they mm -hmm. become more capable of embodying, we could say, divine intelligence. Um, if you go in the other direction, you know, can, a, can an amoeba do that? Can a cockroach? I mean, you, as you go up the evolutionary scale biologically, there's greater and greater complexity and greater and greater sort of ability to, you know, as the Bible says, man is made in the image of God to sort of attain or live in God consciousness. Well, that is true. And we take on, I mean, in, in these books like the, the Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift and in the interview with the universe, talked about how, you know, we sometimes have an idea though, we're just like kindergartners here on earth. No, we are masters. Anybody that takes on mental illness, um, anxiety, trauma, uh, drama that we take on, you, you are a master to do that. And so, yes, it is an absolute, but the, you know, as Jesus said, there are many mansions in my father's house. There are many realms, many different dimensions. Some, some, I mean, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I think sometimes people will take on the role of an animal just to have a rest or something, or they take on, they go to another world. I mean, this yeah. might sound strange to other people, but it's only sounds strange because you're so the human brain and mind is so limited. We, we are not the only, I mean, there are so many different ways that you can take on, but yes, taking on human form, you actually have to be very um, strong and very, very courageous to do it because before you come into your body, you're saying, yeah, I'll take on, you know, the loss of a child and I'll take, I'll take that on because I want to learn compassion and help other parents who lost help. That's all what it's about. It's always a meaning like I want to help others. I want to grow in my compassion and I want to, so there's always a meaning, but it is, it's, it's, it's a very intense, uh, it's a very intense thing. And I once heard a spiritual teacher say that a lot of times, you know, before we take, when we're in the, before we come into this life, when we're sort of negotiating what we're going to take on, we try to bite off more than we can chew because yes. we really want to, you know, we really want to evolve. We say, yeah, lay it all on me. I can take it. And whoever, I did that. whoever's talking to us at that stage says, nah, maybe it's not so fast. You know, just, <laughs> we're going to give you this much, but you won't be able to handle more than that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, who takes on the worst fears of all of humanity? Come on, you know, yeah. by myself, and the craziness. Yeah, it was really, really intense and, and still is. But I just have a knowing in me that that's it, that it's right. When you, when you, when you allow your, to follow your heart, you, know, you kind of have to know the difference between the mind and the heart. When you follow your heart, that doesn't mean you're not going to have challenges. But when a challenge comes, it feels you're like, I, I know this is right, even though it's really, really challenging. If you're really connected inwardly, you can feel the rightness. Not that you like it or that you want it, but I mean, it. there's a sense of rightness that you understand that there's some meaning. There's some. That's the thing. People must understand there's a deeper meaning to everything in the infinite universe. And so it's you're not a victim of anything. And then the guide said, please, please clear this up. We cannot move into a higher state of consciousness with people just believing that things are happening to them randomly. And why does this just keep happening to me? And they're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to move beyond that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, yeah, you've, you've taken on a lot. Um, but at the same time, you're an educated Western woman, um, you know, who is really materially blessed in many ways, even though you, you have had very little money at times, but you know, you're not a child picking through garbage dumps in, in the, you know, Asia or living in the sewers of, of Bogota or something like that, some, which are some references that I found in your book. You know, there's some people who are born into really horrific challenges. So, and who, who die under those circumstances. So, but I would imagine that you would stick to your guns even on that as would Rob Schwartz and say, even that, we've signed up for, for some evolutionary purpose, right? Well, I haven't taken it on in this lifetime. No, you're right, yeah. And that we've taken, the guy said, you've all done all things. Yeah, good point. You've been paupers, you've been kings, you've been everything in between, you've been the victim, the victimizer. That's why you cannot judge, because we've all done it, and it's all just playing this drama of these different experiences. And 
Yes, I, I think that what I was going to take on, I needed to have a Western, I mean, I'm very educated and I'm very, you know, all the, all the things that I am, I needed those things in order to make it through what I took on and then also to be able to communicate it. Mm, yeah, so I needed, I needed those elements. Obviously, if I was picking through trash somewhere, how would I be able to do what I did? So um, I'm sure there are many other, li- because when I, I watched a movie once and someone was homeless and I cried for 30 minutes, cried and cried and cried because I knew it's something in me. Like I know that I had that experience and actually earlier in the journey, one of my fears that I had to face was being homeless, like in the traditional sense. And I had to go to a homeless shelter. So, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've faced You've those. There, yeah. Oh God. Yeah. And it was, and, and not only that, but my guidance was, that you are here in these places, so many places across the planet. It wasn't just about not having money. It was about the misuse of power. And it was about fear of authority. And it was about shifting the balance of power within myself. So I was continually put in these situations where someone was misusing their power. And then I was guided. Now you speak up. Mm. And I had no money. I had nothing to back me up in what gives us power in this world. Possessions, name, money, status. And I didn't have that. So people were misusing their power against you in some way? Against me or against the, like I was in the Salvation Army and they were treating the people like dirt and me included. The, the, you mean were, the, the leaders or, or the, the, the yeah the, the people the who ran Army? the place? Yes, huh. I mean Salvation Army is a franchise, so I'm sure there there are many who uh, you know are good. But this one, I was guided to this one, and and I was there, and you know they were it was horrendous what I saw going on there, and they were they were treating people like dirt, and there was hierarchy because. There were the veterans who the government paid for them to be there. So they were, which is, you know, as well they should be. But I mean, they were treated like kings and queens and they didn't ha- have to leave. But we had to leave every day and just go, and it was freezing. And we had to go sit somewhere. Maybe the library would be open. It was, it was really, really, and, but just the treatment. And so I was told, so keep your peace, keep your peace. So I keep my peace for a long while, just observing, observing, observing. And people were, I was teaching people there how to meditate. And they were like, God, what are you doing here? I'm like, you know, I, I felt like I was an undercover journalist because I didn't need to be there. I worked in corporate America. I could, you know, obviously I could get some job, but my, my sister was helping the homeless before she died. And I knew I was there for a reason. And in the end, I was told, now you need to go in and speak up. And I, I go, and this happened, I don't know how many times in this journey where I was in the most difficult circumstance and then said, now you have to go speak up about it. So I, 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 tr- I tried every other thing, like being compassionate and forgiving, which I, you do ha- I did want to forgive because I don't want to be coming from my ego when I walk in there. I want to be coming from a higher consciousness, like this is a gift that you're giving by speaking up for yourself, for them, and for all, because what they're doing is not aligned with love. And so I went in there and I said to the captain and the people, you know, have you ever heard of Matthew 25, 35? Because they're quoting Jesus and then doing everything in the name of Jesus. And I, and they, and you know, Matthew 25, 35 is, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was a stranger, you took me in. Oh, master, when did we do these things for you, Jesus? And he said, what you do on to the least of my brothers, you do on to me. I was thinking of that and very the, quote like two yeah. minutes ago when you started telling the story. <laughs> yeah. So they're only the least. How did they react had- when you said that to them? Well, I want to add, they're only the least because they had the least. They're not lesser than, oh, well, the, I said, you know, you are not treating me and any of these other people like Jesus's brothers and sisters. And she was smiling, but her eyes were daggered. And she said, well, you can leave. And I said, you're right, I can leave. And you know, I don't have anything, but um, I'm asking you, do you think this is how Jesus would, would act? And within a very short time, I got thrown out and this happened. I got thrown out of so many places. One place was a Christian shelter, same type of thing happened. And then the four police officers threw me out because I was questioning the powers that be. Is this how Jesus would really act? Yeah. So I had a lot of that kind of stuff well, going on. Well, this brings up a kind of an interesting point, which is that, you know, did those people actually change? Maybe it, it, it made a little chink it in their matter. armor, you know? Um, it's not about that. It's, I mean, well, it's not about what's that. What's it about? It was, Just your, it was your about personal me. growth? Yeah, okay. Well, we're all interconnected. Yeah. What I do, it, 
I, again and again, it's like shifting the balance of power away from money being your power, away from possessions being your power. When I do that, it affects the whole. Whether or not they change, I mean, that's, I, I can't, it wasn't about that. I mean, I'm sure some of them, maybe they did, but it's, it was, it's, again, this is not a, this is not a, um, it, we're, we're dealing at a higher level of shifting the, the power that's what I was doing in myself and for everyone so that people can speak up when they need to speak up, even if they don't have anything and know that this is okay. You know, so, sure. um, anyway, but, but you I know, have, speaking truth, the power can bring about change as Gandhi and King and yeah, others yeah. have demonstrated. So maybe it's a matter of, um, strength in numbers or something, or, you know, there's a, uh, there's a great story from, I think it's from the Garuda Purana or something in the Vedic literature where this little um, bird had laid its eggs on the seashore. And right. at, one, at one point, a, a wave came and washed the eggs away. And the bird was, you know, distraught and said, and started, I said to the ocean, okay, I'm going to empty you if you don't give my back, back my eggs. So she like took a beak full of water and, you know, mm -hmm. out of the ocean, dumped it on the sand, took another beak full and just kept doing this. And obviously it was a futile exercise, but eventually the, the king of the birds, you know, it came, came to his attention and he came and said to the ocean, okay, give back the eggs or I will suck you dry or something. And of course the eggs were returned. So sometimes it just seems impossible when we make an individual effort like that. But I think if if sort of the right, and if, if it's something whose time has come and we're doing it in the right spirit, perhaps it sort of serves as a, um, a catalyst for a bigger change to to take place. <clears throat> well, yeah, that, that is the point. I mean, people will read this book and they will hear this story and maybe, and I, I did actually send a letter. I met a man who helped me when I got thrown out of one of my many places who helped me. And he'd emailed me later saying, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, yeah, I'd like you to deliver a letter to the Salvation Army and to the churches because the churches in that area, they threw me out too. And so I sent a letter and I just explained, you know, you don't know who comes to your door and I'm a writer and I'm a speaker and I'm going to make public what you're doing. And, you know, um, I'm just, you know, I'm just letting you know that this is, you know, I, I said to them, I forgive you for, you know, not what you do. But, um, but, you know, this isn't going to be, you have, you have to act from love if you're going to, you know, I just, some, some type of letter, I just sent it yeah, because I just felt, yeah. you know, the, the thing is maybe that won't change, but there's a principle in quantum physics called critical mass. And so if enough numbers of people start to, because if you know who you are and you experience that power, then it doesn't matter whether you have money you know, because think about what, what gives power. Like think about when we talk an, a an actor or someone, what is their net worth? How much money do they have their possessions? And so that's the power up until this point in the world, but going forward, that's not going to, we can't move into higher consciousness with everything being about money and possessions. And so I was demonstrating by my own inner being and power and guidance, I was able to speak up in situations where absolutely impossible over and over again as a means of demonstrating something. And, and, and yeah, like maybe other people will take more courage and, it, but you have to be careful because you want to like sit and meditate for a long, long time before you take action. Because if you're coming just from your own judgment and I did not want to come from my own judgment, it's like, look, I don't care. I just want to go sit in some cottage on the beach somewhere. I don't care. I don't, I did not in my human self, like, I don't want to do this. They were like, this is why you're here. So, so I had to really become clear that, yes, you are here to say these things. And it is a gift, even though they won't see it now. And even though you don't see it that much now, like, just get me out of here. You know, just please get me out of here. I don't want to be in a homeless shelter yelling at some, you know, I don't, you know, it's really, really, really challenging. And after I heard your Robert Schwartz interview, where he said that you can talk to the council of elders and ask to be like, I said, the other day I said, could I be released from this contract now it's again and again, being the one like the, uh, bullying or some situation. Let this cup so, pass from me. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's not fun. And the people hated me. And if you ask them now, they probably say, Oh, she's, you know, she's a horrible being, a human being. 
it just was, it's just how it was. And I, the guide said to me that I came in with a lot of power and I said, well, what does that mean? They said, in terms that you can understand, you know how to think for yourself, capital S, and you don't listen and you know that what has been will not carry forward. And that, so because of that, you also decided to witness a lot of misuse of power so that you would not misuse your power. So there was that also. Um, but I'm like, okay, I think I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I get it. So yeah, so a lot of it had to do with authority and power and misuse of power and money. And so it was mm. a really, really, really crazy. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So you're kind of on the fast track learning lessons. <laughs> and, uh, yes. And obviously, um, you know, you are very concerned about the world and you have a broader vision. This is this isn't just about your personal drama of, you know bouncing from place to place around the world and and how you're gonna you know where you're gonna sleep tonight and all this you have kind of a, a much broader perspective than that and you're you're tuned into the to the notion that um big changes are afoot um so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about that um and of course, as I told you, even before we started, if there's anything you feel like talking about that I'm not bringing up, you should just chime in and and, sure. and do that. But um, you know, I've I've often I've long felt that there's going, and as I've many people that that some more enlightened world is somehow on the horizon, and that um, you know, for that to actually dawn or become a reality, a great many deeply entrenched things in our current world economic political mm -hmm. social you know are, are are going to have to somehow change but they seem so entrenched they seem so powerful they seem so solid and um you know it's like that little bird the ocean seems so big um but how you know how do you see really significant changes coming about and um, both the mechanics of it and the actuality of it in terms of what, you know, how things may actually shift. If you, if you care to conjecture uh, how, how things may actually look five, 10, 20 years from now. Well, first of all, those who study non-duality and you've had many on your show who've had these awakenings, right? Where they see that I am not this individual separated personality. This is a temporary thing. And I'm one with all it is. And the world that I see is an illusion. So we kind of got to go back to that. Which is it's not like, to say what, it doesn't exist, but it, it's not what it appears to be. It's not as it appears to be. Exactly. Like it's not a solid world separate from myself, separate objects, yeah, very clearly it doesn't, it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means that it doesn't, it isn't as it appears. So, so this outer world with all of its things, it's kind of not really as it is. It doesn't really have the solidity that it appears to. So that's kind of one, yeah. one level. Yeah, and it's and not it's, just dumb stuff either. It's, when you say it's not no, solid, it's, 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 sort of, it's, it, it's vi vibrating with life every little iota. Pure awareness yeah. and even the body is not what it appears to be. Exactly. And so, and we're get, we're going to, as we go into future, future, we're going to, the guides had said that we're going to transition into crystalline light bodies. I don't know the trajectory if we're talking a thousand years or 20, I don't know, but we're all moving up. So, well, again, the, the principle of critical mass in, in quantum physics states, I don't know exactly what it is, two to 3% of the population focusing inward becoming empowered by their own self yeah. and then allowing that to inform their whole life which includes money and finances and everything else then the dominoes fall yeah and also we're having a lot of help because look at covid do you think that couldn't happen brought the whole world to its knees and i don't think it's done and i've heard through very clear people that i very much trust in channels and my own intuitive that it's this is just the start so this is why I'm here to, 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 to speak about, at least my part of it, about money and how money is nothing. There's only one power. There's only one power, and that power is within you and within you know everything that you see. And you have to actually experientially go into that power like every you know every day. And the more you do, what it does is expand your vibration, right? And when your vibration is expanded, you can then attract. This is law of attraction. To yourself what you need at a much easier higher level because pe people say to me how do you always I, everything i envision it comes and i i heard um you interviewed daryl anka 
the Bashar. And I heard a woman, it was Bashar, the channels, a group of beings. And I heard a woman and she was asking Bashar, um, what is my frequency? Because he could see, he said, well, you're about 147,000 cycles per second. And, and then he, she said, well, what about Jesus and Buddha? And I, I would add like Paramahansa, Yogananda and whoever. And they said, well, they were at about 300,000 cycles per second. And so what, why is because they took on more of themselves internally. They took on more of life. They took on more of who they were, the one at one with all that is. So they were at a higher frequency. And so when we talked about God in the interview, they said to know God is to embrace the full spectrum from dark to light, what we would consider dark to light, and to understand that that is within you. And so look inward instead of outward at the world and pointing fingers, heal those things within yourself, em embrace with love all aspects of the self, which are kind of gone into separation, bring them back. Then you will know God. And that's what Jesus and Buddha did and all the great masters. It wasn't just about light. They had to embrace the full spectrum of duality. And that is what they did. And that brought them to a higher frequency. It's not just about, oh, I'm going to put on a smile and force positivity. That doesn't, there's no real positivity there. So of course it doesn't work. You have to actually clear your limiting beliefs and your judgments and your fears inside yourself. Take your focus off the world. And, and when you do that, you become a massive power in the world. And it's not that hard to do. You, you see right in front of your eyes what you need to you know, work on. And if you see something in the world and you point your finger at how, say, well, have I ever, even at a lesser degree, have I done that, said that, probably in another incarnation, you, you did. Because they say if you saw it, you wouldn't even recognize it if you had not once done it. So you have to forgive what you think you see in the world, in the outer world, which is just an outpicturing of the inner. So this whole law of attraction thing, I think, has been misunderstood, and I can go deeper into that if you want. But yeah, we will. There's there's several things in what you just said, but um, there's a law of attraction thing, which you know some people complain about because it's been applied rather superficially. Oh, I, I like this pearl necklace or whatever. And, and, you, yeah. know, and you know, but um, it has a, a more profound mechanics, which um, is not trivial. And so there's that. We can go into that. And this whole thing about the small percentage influencing the whole, I can give you a couple of quick examples. Um, in the heart, 1% of the cells are called pacemaker cells, and they regulate the firing of all the other cells in the heart. Um, in um, in a magnet, only a small percentage, uh, I don't know how many, maybe 1% of the atoms have to be polarized, and then the whole thing becomes a magnet. In a laser, it's the square root of 1% of the photons have uh -huh. to align, and the rest of the photons in train with those, and the whole thing becomes like one big coherent photon. So there are all these examples in, in nature of small percentages influencing the larger numbers. And so, you know, the idea of the hundredth monkey, which I don't know if that was yep. a true story, but the principle is that a small percentage of the population becoming coherent or rising to a certain level of spiritual realization, the rest of the influence is much more significant than, than the apparent numbers of such people. It, it, can, it can really have a very pivotal uh, transformational effect on the whole. And I think maybe we were already seeing that. I mean, I really feel like the whole spiritual awakening that seems to be rippling across the planet, even though the numbers are small compared to the general population is already really shaking things up and um, is ultimately the solution to the problems which beset us because all these problems are really symptomatic of the mind state yes. of the people <laughs> who, who create the world, you know, who, who pollute the environment, who, you know, rip off, you know, who become fabulously wealthy at the expense of others and so on. This, these are all reflections of m mental conditions. And, and what is spiritual evolution other than a transformation of our mental condition? So if we can really... Um, if that can become as contagious as the virus, if not more so, <laughs> then I think we can uh, see yeah. a big change in the world. Yeah, I mean, first of all, the guide said all matter is created by thought. So what does that tell you? What you think you're seeing is just a collective outpicturing of the deepest fears. You know, I walk through my deepest fears 
of myself and all of humanity. And we're doing that as a collective. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is to heal, to say, oh, this is mine. I take responsibility for what I see in my world, even though it seemingly doesn't have any to do with me. Do you see that happening and, so far? I mean, with COVID and all the, all the shakeup that's happening, do you see any indications that people are beginning to self-reflect? And I, you know. I think there are some, but I'm kind of, I have to admit that I'm a bit dismayed by what I see. Uh, we have to take responsibility of that for myself, but I don't think people are fully, uh, you know, and one of the things the guide said was that there are many beings who took on this lifetime and they are intentionally playing very dense, heavy roles. But because we live in a realm of polarities, there had to be those individuals, which they did out of love, to hold the low energy so the rest of us can go upward. And they said it's inappropriate to name call, to, to denigrate, to make fun of. And I, I think we see a lot of that going on. And I don't know why someone who understands we are all one would do that because you're just putting out into the world what you don't want. I'm guilty you're of saying, it. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I don't do it, but I, I have a lot of friends who do. And I'm just scratching my head going, don't you understand that that's coming right back? on you. So I would encourage people to please stop. You know, if you really want change, then please stop that. And no problem can be solved at the level was created. So by going and slinging mud and angry and pointing fingers and telling and lamenting how terrible everything is, you are just creating massive more of what you say that you don't want. And the guide said it's creating storms and the weather, the fear and the anger and the the blame and the shame and the, all of this is creating massive storms and the energy patterns, the slamming into the, look, we just had the huge hurricane. Well, the, I think that might have something to do with climate change too. I mean, the, well, this is yeah. what they told me. They said all it's right. climate change. Yes. There's things that humans have done who, but the, the worst problem on the planet bar none is fear because fear is an energy and it's ratcheting up so much that it's causing chaos in, 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 they said there is a heating up happening, but even if they said even if there were no pollutants or anything like that, it would still be happening. So I, well, because of there's just needs to be a heating up, things need to shift. And they they told me that you know human beings are very lazy, <laughs> and so we would not make the changes that need to be made unless these things would happen. That's and true. The, I mean, that, you, you, you know, can see that it's like people don't change unless they're absolutely forced to. Right, yeah. and they said like the alcoholic was, has to bottom out before he seeks help. Or right, whatever. yeah. And so they said that if this doesn't happen, if these changes don't happen, and I know we've heard this before, but they said it very succinctly: the human race will not survive I, long term. I, I think they're right. And so we have. This is why we're being hit so hard in 2020, and everybody's lamenting. And I'm celebrating. I'm so 2020 is amazing to me. <laughs> I'm not because I don't have fear about it, but I understand. I understand. Believe me, I understand why why it's very scary. But it's very simple if you just find that inner self. You know, find that inner that will put you in a higher frequency, which means that everything you need will will come. And also to understand quantum physics, that we don't live in a finite world. We, there's no objective world separate from you out there in solid separated objects. It's like, no, it's, you know, what, you know, you may understand this more than I do, Rick, but it's like the wave and the particle. When you put your focus on, a, on the wave, it comes into a particle, it comes into form. So the more you focus on peace and love and joy and laughter and play and, the more you focus on your infinite beingness, you know, really evolved beings are laugh and play. They don't take life seriously. The more you do that, the more in your own individual life, you will see absolute miracles happen. It has nothing to do with the outer world because the outer world is not even really outer. It's, it's like if you want to, ha each person is guided in their own specific way. If you have lost your job and you, are, you're, you do have exactly precise guidance be given to you if you can become still and stop lamenting and you know whatever it is you're doing and try to be to connect with that inner self the answers are there and you and also things will show up people will show up and i i want to say to the people who this is happening to accept help ask for help you know don't be afraid because the guide said we're trying to get you human beings to rely on each other there's a difference between depend and rely. 
And that was what I was given. Like I say, I am not dependent on any one person, place, or condition for my supply for what I need. But I rely on people because that's community and we rely on each other. All, all, everything we have comes through people. If you think about it, if you have money, it comes through a person, through a job or whatever, or a business or a friend or a government or whatever. Yeah. So, no, I have so, a friend who, um, in fact, my next door neighbor has a business in which it's a restaurant, but it all, he also manufactures a product, uh, the food product. And he said that the global supply chains are just totally screwed up right now. He can't get the, the apples he needs for his product, mm. and he can't get the aluminum cans he needs to put them in, and everything's really messed up. And I, this is, I don't know where we'll go with this, but supply chains and supply on the, and the sort of on, on demand way that, that we get the materials we need um, are very tenuous because it's been profitable to sort of have it be just on the edge in terms of accessibility, but a slight disruption can throw the entire chain out of kilter. And that's what's happening in the world right now with many things. And imagine if there were a shutdown of the electrical grid for, um, an extended period of time, you know, and how dependent, which could happen through hacking or a solar flare or any number of things. So, um, you know, we'd, we'd all be in pretty bad shape. And it's so, that, but ultimately, I mean, what can somebody do? They could, they could do the survivalist type of stuff and stock up food and get a generator and all. But I think ultimately the ultimate survival tool is know thyself. Like we've already said, you know, that that's the foundation of it all. Yeah, and the guide said that it's going to be much more local. Like, they're going to go to right. much more local. Like, we're just the community. They said that profit will become the least important. And um, you, they said that when people start to awaken, truly awaken to their power, there will be no longer a need for controls amongst you. There will no longer be a need for government programs at all. Because when you change your energy that changes the world. And so the world is not finite. There's infinite, 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 you know, Potential everything. Resource. Yeah. And so it's not limited. Like there's only so much money in it. That's not true. I'm here to tell you that is not true. There's no finite world that we live in. And the guides kept saying this, there's infinite possibilities. All possibilities exist simultaneously where you put your focus. That's what then comes into your life. So isn't this very simple? You just, if someone who's, as you described, if that's going on, then they need to sit in with themselves and ask, do I need to go in a different direction? Do I need to let it go? And I would say to people, like, if you are losing your home and your job and your car and all these things, you know, of, go inward. If you follow guidance, if you follow ideas, and if you follow everything and it still goes, is going away, then let go. Because you will literally be like me, picked up and put somewhere. And I've seen this happen with people. And it's where they end up is much more peaceful and much more like they, you know, they don't have to struggle so much. But as far as the supply, I mean, kind of have to go with whatever the universe is bringing in. And the guides told me, you know, be resourceful to the greatest degree and be the abundance that you want to see when you don't. Because I asked, what do I do? Money is the is the you know the medium of exchange, and they said just become that abundance that you want to see, like energetically become, and be resourceful and bless bless everything. Don't do this. We we do this thing you know where we fight against everything. It's not a, the more fighting you do, the more the universe brings more fighting. So <laughs> you know you bless yeah. the situation and you bless and you become quiet and. The more, the higher your energy, meaning you just take on this more, more of your own godhood. That's what the new earth is. More of your own godhood. Absolute magic. I, I really think that money could actually fall out of the sky if you <laughs> were at a high enough vibration. Yeah, or not, of not necessarily money, but some better. <laughs> I had, I had money washed up at my feet in Turkey. I was, I, I took all the money I had. I said, that's it. I'm tired of you know hostels or whatever, and I'm gonna get this gorgeous house. And I did, and I was then I had no money left for food, and I was standing in the money washed up at my feet in the ocean. That's interesting. And I went and bought food. So you know, <laughs> yeah, I would say two things to what you just said. Um, one is don't wait until you're at your wits' end to go within. Um, you know, yes. if, when times are good, 
um, you know, get into a spiritual practice and stabilize it, um, because then you're less likely to to hit hit on hard times. And if you do, you're you'll be better able to deal with them. Um, and the second thing is that you know, I think there are relative limitations to certain things. There, there's a limit to how much oil there is, or how much lithium we can mine to make batteries or whatever. But there's an unlimited a resource to which everyone has access, which is your own deepest potential. There's no shortage of that. And you're never going to deplete it. And so start tapping into that and allowing it to flow and flow with greater abundance. And um, that alone could transform the world. We, and, and also in concrete ways. I mean, we wouldn't need oil or lithium or whatever. Better technologies yeah. would come up and uh, we could forget about all that, that stuff that ruins the environment. Yeah, so the guide said there, there's all kinds of things coming in that these, as these things collapse, and they said all these structures that have been created in separation, whether it be education, economics, you know, financial, even religion, all these things that have been created in separation, meaning that we believe they're outside of us and that we somehow need something that's outside of us and that it's finite and we have to fight for it or whatever. All these systems are going to collapse. They are collapsing. They cannot sustain because we're moving into higher consciousness. They said there's all kinds of things coming in behind it, and there are people strategically positioned throughout the world who are bringing these things forward. And if we just would allow, like calm down and allow whatever needs to go, let it go. If you, even if you have to let go of your home and your car or whatever, then let it go you know, follow your inner voice, you know, do what you can do. But then, you know, if, it, if you let go and we let these things come in, you'll do, you will see that it's going to, it's not, we didn't go through this to just crash. We went through this, we're going through this to have a much more free. And that's why I did it. I wanted to be free. I wanted to be completely free and I feel very free and I feel very empowered because I'm not reliant. I'm not dependent. You know, I'm just, you know, I allow, what the universe shows me and tells me and the people who come just come, people just come. I mean, I can tell you stories later on if you want that people just show up. And yeah, why feel, is feel that? Feel free to throw in a story. Anything, even now, if you'd well, like to throw in an example, okay. like I remember one where you were in Scotland and you're trying to get over to Dublin or, or someplace. Yeah. That, that was a good one. If you want to tell that one. Well, there's an, I have a one in mind, but that one, yeah, I was, I was, I got off, I was following, you know, my guidance. And, okay. Go to, go to Belfast. And I was in, no, 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 no. Go to Dublin. And I was in Belfast and it was late at night. It was in this hostel and I just didn't have the money. And I, I kept saying, okay, hello, somebody, you know, what am I supposed to do here? And then they said, go, just go. And it was 1130 at night. It was raining. I'm like, go, just go. <laughs> so I did. And I started walking. I'm like, well, well, I guess I'll go to the train or bus station and see if I can just sleep there or something. And as I was walking along, there was this young woman and she was closing down a restaurant. And I said, Hey, you know, where's the train station? And she said, well, it's over there, but I mean, what's, what are you doing? It's kind of late. And I told her, you know, kind of like what was happening. And she said, no, nope, they're coming to my house. Just like that. She was like, I call them Elizabeth's angels. Cause they, I could feel the energy like, Oh, here's my angel. There's always an angel. And so she just, she was just a waitress, but she took me to her house and her, she had, a, she, you know, this is Ireland. So she had her confirmation name was Mary Catherine, which my sister was Catherine Mary. And I told her the whole story and she was hugely intrigued. And I, I, she fed me and did my laundry and did my laundry. And then the next day she just went to the cash machine and she's a waitress, you know, but she handed me some cash and she's all, oh, there's money for a train to Dublin. And off I went. And it was just, like following, even if it sounded completely crazy. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Um, but I have um, the people one story. Ever, I'll let you tell that next story, but do people ever say to you, yeah, Elizabeth, fine, but everybody couldn't do this per, because we'd all be bumming off each other. And, you know, some people need to have jobs to make money so that people like you can can enjoy their largesse. Yeah, I hear that. But it, first I'm of sure all, it's not, lar not largesse. <laughs> but firstly, secondly, um, that's not true. We, that's a, the old Newtonian physics that there's an, uh -huh. a finite amount. And I'm saying that's not true. It, it, there's infinite because it's all just potentiality. And then when you put your focus on it, it comes into being or seemingly does because it's not even really as it appears to be, but it seemingly comes into form. So that's not, that's not really true. Well, some not people have to work in order to produce stuff. 
but maybe that's their I, dharma. I, I, if they feel compelled to work, I mean, I, I, I would have been happy many times to take a job and was not given that option because it would have been so much easier. I, I just want to be in a, in a nice place somewhere by myself. I mean, my personality is not this when I'm doing my personality. I love my own little cozy space. I love Decker. I mean, I'm doing completely against the grain of my personality to do this, but it's for the, the, the good of all, but trying to demonstrate something. And you, and not I mean, you, it was a lot of work to write this book and now you're writing well, another I, one. I, I, so I'm it's not like you're just sitting around, you know, oh, no. Yeah. no, I'm not sitting around. I mean, I'm working, but I don't even buy into that whole work. That's like old energy to me. I uh -huh. mean, I'm doing what my heart is. I'm doing what I'm here to do. The universe is providing me with what I need money wise and everything else. And it, it's not like the one to one just because people don't see, okay, I sold the book. I get money. And I actually stopped selling everything intentionally. I was guided. Don't place any needs on this project and then allow people to give to you. So, I mean, I could have sold all these things I could sell. And if, even when this book comes out, I'm not going to sell it. I'm going to make it available for free because that's my service to the world. And I trust in the universe to bring me what I need. And, and, and that's just how I'm going to do it. I'm not saying everybody needs to. But everybody has a different path. And it, there's no, you know, again, Rick, the universe is infinitely intelligent. So that's just not true. There's some people who love their job and they love what they do and great. But the, the whole manufacturing, there's so many jobs in the world that aren't even needed. And they're going to, they're going to, I think they're going to go away because it, it, the whole thing is to come into a more community, community oriented way of living where, you know, you grow food, you share. As I feel like it, we're going back it's a more expanded version of that, but coming back towards that. And I was guided to many, many communities all around the world. Cause that's another big interest of mine is community. And I think it's going to go more towards that. And it's much simpler and it's much more relaxed and we're not going to necessarily have, I, I don't know for sure, but I mean, I think it's going to be a lot less of this manufacturing and all these things going on, but I think you're probably right. Um, I don't you know. know. At the moment, we're much more tied into it. I mean, we have a house, we have a car. I will bet you have a cell phone. I do know, have a cell phone. Some some well, poor, it's some poor character worked in a sweatshop in China or something to make that cell phone. So you know, people are working to produce stuff that but you and I use. I'm just saying it's like a gradual progression away from something that. I'm not saying yeah. it's going to just drop instantaneously. Exactly. It's, it's right. not. But yeah, I'm just saying that the world is changing very very rapidly it was well not maybe not rapidly but it's changing and everybody will be supported in their own way if they're a manufacturer maybe they'll change what they manufacture or something or maybe you know it'll, it's just there's infinite intelligence guiding this so it's yeah, not no, some agree. random random what do you thing. think about um i mean i want you to tell that story that you were going to tell yeah. so keep <laughs> that in the back so. of your mind but yeah. um what do you think about um you know, the extreme wealth inequity in the world. I don't know the numbers, but, you know, some tiny percentage of people have more money than the vast majority of, of other people. Or, you know, there's like, I don't know what it is, just a handful of people have, have the wealth equivalent of the bottom 50% of humanity. Um, and, you know, people are living in, you know, desperate poverty and others are multi-multi-billionaires. Um, that seems imbalanced to me. I mean, some people, you, you mentioned this and some people are saying, what is suggesting communism, socialism? Um, but <laughs> it, it just doesn't seem um, like it would be characteristic of a more enlightened society. Uh, it doesn't reflect compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, no. You know, um, so what do you, what do you think about that? Well, Same I mean, reflections. It's, du it's duality, you know, there's polar, uh, that's the realm we're in. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with wealth. I'm all for it. In fact, you know, one, one of my, I feel like my, my journey is to demonstrate. I, I was named after two Queens and so was my sister. And that energy is with me all the time. I don't have a problem with wealth. I mean, some people, if you have a big problem with wealth, you're never going to have it. So, but I mean, I don't need it. It's that the guy had said, you know, there's this, this thing between needs versus desire. If you shift the need over to the desire category, which is much higher energy. So I'm like, yeah, I like money. I mean, I like nice things. I came in with a, with a liking of beautiful things. And I even asked about this and the guy said, it's perfectly okay. That's a myth that you, as a spiritual being, you can't have those things. It's just that if your identity is wrapped up in it and you're attached, yeah, 
But how, and, and the true. question is, how many tens of billions of dollars do you need when others are living on two dollars a day or something? Right. I mean, what, what the, can you that, do with all that money? The guide said um, that greed is a cancer on our planet, and m- many have accumulated on their own greed um, far more than what they need. And yes, that is, that is, I think there is going to be about, there needs to be a balancing out, but at the same time, I don't want to denigrate anyone or judge anyone because as we said in this realm, we've all played all roles. So I feel like as these people who are quite wealthy awaken, they will start to feel like, wow, maybe I can do something with this wealth. Like I want to corral some of these people and say, let's make a community. (laughs) And I think I'm going to do that someday because everything I visualize comes true. But like, let's, let's, you know, since we still have ownership and everything, okay, take your billions and let's buy this land and let's create beautiful places yeah. for people, you know, I, I don't know, but Some I, I feel doing like stuff like that. I mean, Bill Gates yeah. and Warren Buffett and others are just, they've yeah. got it all set up to pretty much give it all away uh, over the course of their lifetimes or after they die. Um, in the case of Buffett, who's pretty old, but um, you know, so that's good. I think I think that it can be used for good, and I think that people, as they start to awaken, will just naturally feel like, "Gosh, maybe I can do something with this wealth." And and I think it'll just I think it's going to naturally evolve. I don't think we have to force no. or say this is bad and this is because the guide said the biggest mistake human beings make is judgment. And I know a lot of people that judge wealthy people, and I don't. I'm like, hey, you know, this is the role they came to play, and maybe they'll transition to something else. But to judge them, yeah, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that the, no, the, the, the situ- there's think, a yeah. lot of people suffering, and that I think, as you say, as you awaken, you begin to feel for the suffering of the world. And um, if like you Buddha. if you happen <laughs> to be super wealthy, then maybe that feeling will translate into concrete action. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I, I know you are judging, but I'm seeing people who do. Yeah. They really, really get into it. They talk about it constantly, <laughs> and it's just. You know, don't do that because this is this person's role. You can't know the guy, you know, it says in the Course of Miracles, it says it's not that you should not judge. It's that you cannot judge because you, as a human being, you don't see the full picture. You don't know what roles people took on and what for what reason. And there are wealthy people that are awakening and they do naturally feel to share and, um, so I, I, and I've had many of them come to me, thank God, you know, that they, the many people who have much more than what they need have helped me. And I've envisioned that happening, you know, because I'm very powerful in my intention and my visualization. And then it comes. That's basically how I, you've been able to get along for the last 12 years is people. You know, helping I just, you. yeah, people helping me. And I feel like it was a soul agreement though. Like they, that they just wanted to be part of the journey and they, they are. And, but it's sometimes it's the same people over and over, but then I have like new people come in, like this friend who I met who, whose place I'm in at the moment. And so naturally, I think that they'll feel that they want to share. And I would encourage those who have more than what they need. And if you have a more stable environment, if your heart so guides you to, to reach out to these ones who are falling off the system, because it's quite terrifying. And it's not a fun, it's, I think it's much more fun to give than it is to be the one who has to, you know, you know, say, could someone help me? You know, that's very, very, it's, it's very hard. So I would encourage that. Um, so everybody's different. I mean, some people are having no change and that's okay. They have some type of part to play. And if you're very wealthy, I would suggest that maybe you could sit in quiet and pray. What can I, or meditate? Is there something I can do with this that actually not, I mean, it's you know nothing wrong with profit, but I mean, if you go that way, then it's just more of the same, but go in a way that, that serves the world and brings life affirming things into the world. And, and, you know, but then again, I, I, when I was in that homeless shelter, I did meet a lot of people who they have a very strong victim mentality. And, and, and so if you have a victim mentality, you're going to attract at that level. I think if they change their belief, because, because the guide said, it's all about belief. And I would be like, I was walking in Myanmar, you know, these people were begging, you know, to me. And I looked in their cup and I thought that person has more than I do right now. <laughs> um, yeah. But I don't, I feel like a billionaire. I feel rich. I guess the name Elizabeth Ann, you know, it's, I don't, I don't feel, it's a belief system that I know that I'm infinite. And even though at this moment I have nothing, I know more is going to come and I'm going to follow the guidance and people are going to show up when they need to show up. And that has been proven over and over and over 
every day. So it's not just some one time thing. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to say that again, if, if um, a large percentage of the world's population it, were functioning the way you're functioning, I think that we would see just this incredible abundance and, and it might yes. be, it would be po impossible for you and, or anyone to specifically predict exactly how it's going to come about. But I just have a deep confidence that it would, that there would just be this sort of wellspring of, of abundance and creativity uh, flowing through every individual life that would transform the outer world into a, you know, heaven, really. Ab absolutely. And I, I mean, there, there are people who are, are working on this. And it's true, like when a person has their needs met, their basic needs food, shelter, and they're allowed to be creative. My God, some of these people, like, and some people who take on like a homeless path are actually very evolved, awakened beings. And they're there to teach other people about compassion. Or I've met many of these people. And so uh, when there are people who are allowed to express their true inner being, the miracles come out of that, you know, all kinds of inventions and creativity. And look at the teenagers around the world who are inventing things because the kids have come in at a higher vibration, as the guides explained. And so this is all unfolding. We don't have to get too cerebral about how is it going to be, but all each person has to do is just do what I'm suggesting and go do that inner work and inner self and listen and you know maybe you don't get it the same way i get it but you will get it somebody will appear an idea will appear mm -hmm. something Seek ye first and all else should be added unto thee and when i asked the guides about that quote they said another way of saying that is i am that i am and in all ways i am all that i am I'm like how are those two because what the, what you're saying is i am much more than what i appear to be and that brings me everything I need. And so again, we have to just remember that the world is not finite. That's an old energy belief system and the structures in it are all old energy. So we have to allow the new to come in. And um, so I think I, I, I've met people, I call them like billionaire Buddhas. They're not really billionaires, but I just use that term. And this, uh, this story that I'm going to tell involves a woman. She's certainly not a billionaire, but she has more than what she needs. And she's she's doing just what we're talking about. So I'll tell that story. Yeah, go ahead. Tell the story. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, it kind of starts back. I was in um, Virginia running. I, I had everything that I wanted to do, I've done. I wanted, I always wanted to kind of be run a B&B, &B, you know, and, and want to be on a farm. And so I always lived in big cities. And so lo and behold, um, a friend who'd been following the journey offered me just out of nowhere, we want to come run my, my, my Airbnb. Her family has many properties and there was this beautiful estate in, in Virginia. And I said, yes, immediately I was on a plane within three days and I ran her Airbnb for a year. And I kept getting these trucks driving by though, that said England, England, England. I'm like, Oh, I guess I'm going to England again. So I, I was like kind of trying to work. Well, how am I going to get there and where am I going to go? <laughs> and nothing was coming. And then, so, okay. Well, okay I laugh because so I've, seen, I've seen hundreds of those trucks, but I didn't feel like going to England. But anyway. I go. Well, for me, it was a sign, you know, <laughs> I, I, because I feel England. I, I've yeah. always had the feeling this is my third time here. But I, 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 I felt it anyway, but it, I was just like, okay. But then it, nothing happened. So I was sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, praying and thinking, what, what? Because I felt that I was at the end of my time at this place. I loved it. But the guidance was, no, it's time for you to go. And people thought I was nuts for leaving this because it was so beautiful. And I had a, this gorgeous estate all to myself, except on weekends when people came. And it was just amazing. But no, I, it's time for me to go on. So I, one of my great dreams was to live in New York City. I just, there's even the words New York City just sends me to the moon. I, I, I don't know why it's supposed to be past life or something, but um, I wanted so badly. And I, then I got it. You're going to New York. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm like, well, I don't have, I, mean, what, I didn't have money. I didn't, I, the money I had because I was not making a huge, and that it was actually kind of a little job, but it was mostly about women board and just a little bit of money. So I didn't have money to go to New York. So I put out a post on Facebook. This was my guidance. And I said, anybody in the New York area, please, I just feel really guided. And I, in my mind's eye, I kept seeing this one man who had been following my journey. Over and over, I saw him in my mind's eye. But I wasn't going to just approach him because that puts people into fear. So I just put out this post. And within three minutes, he popped up in my messenger and said, hey, I've got a place. 
come with me, come stay with me for a while outside of New York City. So that was it. I went to New York City and I went to this place in New York. And then the day came where like we both knew like this is just over. But I didn't have anything. Like I thought something was going to appear in New York City that would, and it didn't. So I was like, well, okay. And so many times in the journey when this happened, I, my guidance was just go. Like with nothing, just go. Because he, you know, he had offered as much time as he could and I felt it too. So I said, okay, universe, if I have enough for three nights in an Airbnb, I'll go to New York City. And so I put it out on Facebook. Does anybody want to help me? And some people did. I had exactly enough for three nights and I went to New York City and I stayed in an Airbnb for three nights. And then after that, it was like every single day, I would be down to nothing and I would go sit in a cafe. And my big dream was to dance. I mean, I, this was last year and I was, I'm, was 54 years old. And I'm like, you know, so I have this big belief that aging is a myth. And I'm just like, I'm going to go to the best ballet schools in the world. And I did, I, I would sit in these cafes and then some money would come in because I have a lot of people that kind of follow and help, but I don't know when they're going to send or what amount and, or if anybody does. And so anyway, some money would come, but it wouldn't be enough for that night at the Airbnb, but it would be enough for a dance class. And my guidance was dance class, go. So I go to the dance class and then, so I'm like living this crazy every night. I would, didn't know where I was going to be, but I'm taking the dance classes and I would have enough for food and I'd eat my food. And then the next amount of money would come and I'd go to an Airbnb. So this went on for like three weeks. And then my dream was to live right near Central Park. And I got this little guidance, go on Craigslist. So I found this little ad for an in-home dog walker posh as we say in England, posh is part of Upper East Side Manhattan. Sent the thing, they hired me, and I became an in-home dog walker. <laughs> and so I, I, it was just at night. And so I was going to my, my beloved dance classes all day, walking in Central Park, doing my dog walking. And I did that for a while, and then the job ended because um, they were moving. So I was suddenly without a home or anything. And I was like, what am I? I wanted to spend time in a monastery. So I kept getting, go to a monastery. And I'm like, okay, go to a monastery. So I looked up monasteries and Get I called this one. to a nunnery. <laughs> yeah, it was that. And in the meantime, a friend popped up and said, I have some Airbnb credits, so I'll put you in an Airbnb for two nights. Okay, so go to the, so I called this one and they said, we have, an, we have three nights available. So I was like, I don't want just three nights. I want to go for a long time. So I couldn't, didn't make the decision. And my guidance was go to Penn Station because I had gone to New Jersey in this Airbnb. Go to Penn Station, go to Penn Station. So I'm sitting in Penn Station like, well, okay, I'm in Penn Station. What am I going to do? And the guidance finally came, you have the monastery already. Yeah, but it's only three nights. Go. <laughs> so I went to the monastery. It's Holy Cross Monastery in New York. Amazing, amazing beings there. Loving, so loving. And I kind of told the story there and she said, we don't want your money. You can stay for a month, whatever. And immediately I was in this beautiful place, gorgeous, right on the Hudson River in this monastery. Well, a nun, I met a nun and she was about to leave. And I heard her talking about San Diego. And I said, oh, you're from San Diego. And she's like, yeah. And we started talking and she said, well, I just became a nun um, in in my most of my life, I was a professional musician and I played in the San Diego Symphony. Well, I almost fell over because my mother who has passed and my father who has passed both were musicians and played in the San Diego Symphony Orchestra. She knew them, not just knew them, but was good, good friends. She, oh my God, are you Gloria Hill's daughter? And we both started crying. <laughs> and she said, well, I'm going to England to go to many monasteries. And I knew right then and there, that's what's where I'm going. And, and I, I got, I was able to get the money for the plane ticket. I came, went off to England, traveled all around and ended up in St. Michael's convent in, in, um, in, uh, Gerard's cross. Again, these beautiful, beautiful, they were such beautiful examples. They let me be alongside her with the community. I was a, an alongside her. I lived there for four months. The most beautiful, they, they live very abundantly because they share everything. And they were such a good example of community and then, but then I only had a certain amount of time and I had like three days left. I didn't have money. I didn't know where I was going to go, but I had met this woman that had been there on silent retreat several times. And I kept having a feeling about her. And then one day, like two days before I had to leave, she was there and she, she I was telling her kind of what was going on. And she looked up at the statue of Jesus and Mary 
this woman is like a Christian mystic. She's just, she's just like, she's like um, St. Teresa of Avila. She's incredible. And she looked at the statue of Jesus and Mary and got this, you have a house to offer. And she's like, oh yeah, I do. Because I just moved out of my house. And she's the one I'm talking about who has more than what she needs, but she was going to make her home available for some Syrian refugees. So the house was getting ready for Syrian refugees. She said, but not for four months, so you can live in my house. So all in one fell swoop, I ended up in this house, beautiful, gorgeous house on the river for four months. And then she's, she's part owner of her house in Greece, Greece. And that's been offered to me. I haven't, I've tried twice to go, but because of COVID, I couldn't get there. But it just goes to show, just this, out of nowhere, this person came and said, here's a house. Yeah. And it was, it's not, and then, you know, here's another house in Greece. And and she shared everything with me, money and and you know, and then this new person Lorenzo who's helped me right now, he came out of nowhere. So you can see by this story that people just show up. Yeah. And yeah. and it, it, it's I didn't do it. I didn't go looking. And and when I was in the convent, I was getting a little bit nervous. And I thought, well, maybe I should like offer to clean the rooms and maybe they'll pay me. And my guidance was, is that what you really want to do? I'm like, well, no, not really. <laughs> I want to just, see. and I was learning, you know, so I said, well, I'm not going to do it then. And I just didn't do it. And then um, I, I learned how to draw. And so I spent hours in creativity. Creativity is a very high energy. And that's when the answer just came in. So you see, getting my human mind out of the way by learning how to draw for hours and hours the answer was able to come in because I wasn't in the way with my limiting beliefs and all of that. So I guess that's, that's the story. One of the stories, one of the many, many, yeah, there are many <laughs> just I mean, shapes up and the right thing at the right time. That's cool. Have you ever heard of peace pilgrim? I'm yes. Gonna, I'm going to get her up on the screen here just so people can see her beautiful face on the screen. Yeah. So peace pilgrim was this beautiful woman who, um, just basically walked around the United States for years with nothing but the shirt on her back and a, a shirt that said Peace Pilgrim on it. And mm -hmm. um, if anyone hasn't heard of her, I highly recommend you get her little book and read it. Um, she was definitely in a higher state of consciousness. And she just um, kind of experienced what you've been experiencing, which is that she would just be taken care of and she wouldn't ever... She didn't have any possessions. She didn't ask for anything, but people would just offer what she needed when she needed it. And uh, very inspiring. Everyone should, it's like a classic book that I recommend everyone check out if they haven't seen it. Yeah, I've heard about Peace Program and a lot of people have said that I'm like her, although I wouldn't want to be sleeping on the side of the road and um, what she did. But I mean, it's similar. And, and also I do ask for help, but I, I didn't start asking. I really wanted to prove to myself that it wasn't just me asking for help and receiving help. So for the, I would say the first four to six years of the journey, I never asked for help once. I was like almost like pathologically refusing to ask for help. <laughs> and then at some point someone said, Elizabeth, you know, I think you've proven it to yourself. Why don't you start asking? So I started to ask and then it just, it, you could just feel that it was the right people who said, yeah, I'll help because they wanted to be part of the journey. But I really did demonstrate to myself that it wasn't just about fundraising, you know, because anybody can do that, I guess. But it was more, I, I, I allowed people to show up. And so sometimes the guidance would be, okay, go on to Facebook and ask. And if I didn't get that guidance, no matter how, how dire the situation, I wouldn't, I would just say, I would write what, this is what's happening. And then invariably somebody somewhere would, would say, well, I, I would like to help or whatever. So mostly it was in recent times, it was more about just asking, can anybody help in this situation? Because I had been doing it for so long and I knew that I would receive if I, if I felt guided, yes, this is a moment to go ahead and ask your community, because it's my community. They know what I'm doing. They know why I'm doing it. And they wanted to be part of it and they would help. So, But I encourage people to ask for help. It's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Have you and had any, um, you're 55, you said. Um, hmm? Have you had any impulses that at some point you might just settle, get lead, lead a more established life i mean uh how's this going to work when you're 65 75 you know 80 <laughs> oh i really don't know but the first thing is that i think aging is a myth and there's all kinds of information coming to me that this is true and that i'm not 
you know, quite there yet. But I mean, when we, as we go into higher consciousness, the guides had said that your bodies are making their own awakening right now. And that the body is moving from a carbon based body into a crystalline light body. So I really believe that the aging process can and will reverse because if there's no time and there is no time, then, and if I'm an infinite being, the body, not even if, if a, what I have learned is that the body is not actually a physical organism moving on a timeline in time and space. That's the illusion. I mean, it, it, we have to honor it as it appears, but really all time is now. And, and I am an infinite being, you know, like, like Jesus, like Buddha, like anyone who came to demonstrate. And they were able to do things that other people couldn't do. Why? Because they had taken on more of who they were. So as I take on more and more of who I am, I don't believe that I need to become ill and downslide. But yes, I would like to have, I very much and have wanted for years to have my own place in the world, but I, it's not going to necessarily be um, the back to like a job. I, I couldn't, I would, it would kill my spirit. So somebody, somebody will offer something or it'll be part of a community. And then, but my dream is to, to share this wisdom. So I want to travel the world and I want to share the wisdom in any way that I can. And so I, in, but see, I understand that I can envision what I want and it will come. So I'm envisioning how I want it to be. And I have some pretty big visions, which I won't even share because if we shared them, people would say, Oh, please. But I, I, the guides had told me that I came in with a much bigger vision of what's possible. And in, in fact, I always say that part of my mission is to demonstrate what people think is impossible in the body, in the mind, in the spirit. So I, um, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that I need to decline and be decrepit and need. And I also don't believe that I need healthcare. I don't believe that I need 401k. I don't believe that I need retirement. Say what you want, but I don't believe that. No, that's cool. I mean, uh, I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, I just think it just doesn't, it just doesn't, it, when I see like someone who goes from like a young person to a girl, like for some reason inside of me, that doesn't seem normal to me. Hmm. Doesn't, doesn't seem, seem normal actually, to the Buddha either, you know, when he's, when he was living this sheltered life and had never seen an old person, yeah. and finally got out and saw <laughs> some, he thought, whoa, what, what's wrong with them? <laughs> that's what, I mean, it just, and I'm not saying it's bad. That's what they've chosen. But I mean, I think it's a choice. And I, I think that yeah. in, in that, it's well, you know, every, every saint and sage, with the exception of a, possibly a very few, whoever walked the earth, ended up dying. Um, and maybe the times are different now, and maybe we'll all end up in crystalline bodies. Or maybe it, it is that, you know, if we're meant to be immortal in some sense, then there might be better bodies than these in which to do it. And these bodies will die. I mean, all these guides you're talking to, they have bodies, um, but they're not yes. human bodies. Um, and they, they don't necessarily live in the earth plane. So I don't know if hanging out in the earth plane perpetually is our ultimate destiny. But And actually, there's a question that came in that um, relates to this very point from Cheryl in Florida. She asks, um, if the human species doesn't survive, will we become part of another realm? Well, yeah, you're an eternal being or eternal beings. The human part is just a temporary little game we're playing. Uh, but I think the human race will survive because I think people, we, I, I have it on good authority that we've already made the decision that humanity will awaken. And there are many people who are transitioning and that's okay. I mean, it's sad, of course, when you lose somebody, but there, I, you know, I was told this, that people, for whatever reason, either they're not ready to take this ride with mother earth, who's moving out of the third dimension through the fourth into the fifth, which is a light, much lighter but you have to purify, you have to purify and you have to take that ride. So it's not everybody wants to take that ride right now, or they have another part to play like my sister. So there are many people who are transitioning and you can see it on my Facebook page. I have like people who just suddenly are die and they're just young people. And so there's, there's choices being made on a soul level, all, all death, all everything is made on a soul level, which is a level we don't see consciously but it's made. And so it's okay that if people choose to transition from this world and do something else, but, um, yeah, some people I think that the human race will survive, but with the drastically reduced population, I don't know if climate change were to reach six degree temperature increase, there wouldn't mm -hmm. be any human life left, but even three degrees, um, could 
drastically reduce the population. And of course, there are many other things which could do so. Well, all I have to say is that I'm going to find out. Yeah, I think we all. <laughs> is it true that I don't have to go through? I mean, I have some aging, but it's not it's not very significant. And I I want to know that is it true that I have to um, that I have to become old and gray when there really is no time and that I am this infinite being? Is it true? Any so gray hair I, showing up yet? Oh yeah, yeah, but not not a lot. Not I don't have a huge amount. <laughs> but I mean, that's not even because I'm not I'm nowhere near. I mean, I haven't made these transitions that need to be made fully i mean i'm surely working on it but one of the things and this is i'll share this just off the cuff that one of the guidance that i've been intent in, in, repeatedly getting is you do not need food food over food i that yeah. and in the interview with the universe they talked about how the human body at a certain point will not be able to digest food it doesn't need food that food is a habit you know that's really hard but i i keep getting it over and over and over eat less, eat less, eat less. And I, I heard once where they talked about through one of the channels that Jesus ate almost nothing. And so I said, so finally over the last week, I'm like, okay, fine. It's very hard because I love food, but I've been cutting down almost to nothing. And all of a sudden my neck has been really stiff, my back, all of a sudden I'm stretching and I'm like hugely flexible just from three days. of. So I, I think that the body is changing. The bo- I was told the body is making its own awakening and the DNA is, is shifting. And so um, do I know for sure if this is possible? No, I don't know anything for sure. But I, I one thing is for sure is that I intend to find these things out experientially. Yeah, no, that's what a very good pos- attitude. I mean, my attitude toward all these kinds of points is I take them as hypotheses. And hypothesis yeah. means that you know, there's something which, there are things which could be explored experientially. That's what a hypothesis is in science. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a scientist doesn't say, I absolutely believe this. That wouldn't be scientific. He says, all right, this has some probability or, you know, some promise. And so I will investigate experientially. And if it doesn't work out, fine. He wants to know the truth. He doesn't, he's not attached to a particular uh, outcome. Yeah. Well, the guides also said that your truth actually lies within you that there's not really any separate objective truth, really. I mean, it's as you waken, your truth changes. Um, so they said, as you believe, so it is. So if you believe in aging, if you, and most people, I hear them saying these things, and I'm thinking, why are you saying that? You know, as you believe, so it is. Oh, well, I'm 50 now, and I'm going to have to get a house that's one story because I'm going to be, you know, going yeah. downhill, and I'm going to have to get, you know, funeral insurance, and I'm going to, I'm like, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> You're, I, I don't know. I mean, I was told I came in with a knowing about that things can be different, and I just don't understand. I just doesn't seem normal to me to have that attitude. And so, you know, if if I'm wrong and I end up, you know, aging and croaking and whatever, <laughs> I mean, not that I don't think that I'm going to pass on, but I think there's yeah. going to be some major changes in my lifetime in this body that would be considered like, wow that's how how is that done how is that possible because i just believe it yeah you know, you know they, i think that you there's something to what you're saying i mean i don't think it means you're going to be physically immortal but um i mean no, i've interviewed some not. people in their 90s um yeah and uh, there was one guy who was one of the designers of some of the more popular muscle cars they called them in detroit and i forget his name at the moment but um he was when I first got in touch with him, he was like at 92 or three. And he said, well, I just had my feet amputated, but he said, I've never felt better in my life. And um, (laughs) my wife and I are going to buy an RV and move to California. He was on the East coast. (laughs) I don't know. I don't think he ended up doing that, but you know, obviously he, he didn't feel like an old man in his spirit. Um, So, you know, the body is, it's a vehicle. And sometimes we need to to trade in a, a, an older vehicle for a newer vehicle, but you know that which we are doesn't age, and many people actually experience it that way if they don't identify with the body primarily. Right, I've heard people, and also there are many sages, according to I've never met one that they live for a couple hundred years. I mean, this yeah. is these legends, and I don't know, but I, I mean, if you read autobiography of Yogi, this yeah, is about, about all aging. Those people, yeah. It's people who don't haven't eaten for years and they live off of light. And I think that these, at, you know, in those times it was very rare, but I, uh, the guides told me that what's going to happen is that 
the, there will be people becoming fructarians and even aquatarians, which means they only drink water. This will be very common. And so there's a lot of changes happening in the body, which right now sound crazy, <laughs> but we're kind of looking at it through a separation viewpoint. So I don't know what's going to happen in regards to me and my this body that I've taken on, but I mean, I really do have a sense that the body is not what it appears to be. Yeah. And if you if you listen to what like Rupert Spira, what he teaches about all you have to be aware of is what you sense. Is the body is like a sensation, and there's perception and hearing and seeing, but that's just pure awareness that you're that's having that experience. So I take that I. I feel that, that this is, this is not really solid, you know, being, but anyway, maybe, maybe we're yeah, we favor that too much, but it's just, I, I want to say that don't talk about how you're going to age. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. You know, it, whatever happens, happens. You just accept it and you do your best with it. But I mean, don't just assume that you're going to get old and have the disease. Well, or what was that Bible verse where Jesus said, you know, don't worry about, it was similar to that birds of the field thing about not right. storing your grain and your this and the, that where, where, you know, animals can eat it and mold can get right. it or something. But, you know, how's that, you know, can you quote that verse? No, I can't. I know, you know I, what I'm, I'm talking not about, sh- though. It's, it's yeah. like. Um, well, also, also he said, if thine eye be single, thy body shall be full of light. light. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean? I mean, he also said, isn't it written? I said, ye are gods. And he, he even said also, and this is in my Twin Souls book that my teachings are not for this age, they're for the next. And that, so these things that he said that people didn't really understand, I think they're going to become more and more understandable. If thine eye be single, in your your inner right. being, your third eye, Oneness, yeah. thy body shall be full of light. Mm-hmm. So Well, and Bob Dylan said, the times they are changing. So, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and yeah. indeed they are. So what would you like to say by way of conclusion, since we're about at the two-hour point here? Um, you know, obviously, any interview like this is just a little sampling of, of uh, what a person could potentially talk about. And I think people would enjoy this. Is this book still available somehow? Well, it, it's I was guided to kind of take it out of print, and I give it for free on my author page on Facebook. So people can download um, an electronic yeah, version but of But you it. can – then I found out that there's all these booksellers selling it. Yeah, and it has nothing books. to do with me. I, I don't, I don't get anything from it. But, but if you if you Google it, you can get it like a hard copy, you know. But I, I almost feel like there's going to be a second edition or something because it's like that was written in 2003 to 2006. Yeah, and I'm so different now, I'm just so different. But you know, it, it gives the basic story of my sister and our life mm-hmm. and how she it's passed. And, well, and it yeah, has a and lot of chapters that are all, about all kinds of things in the world that are right. Like, Really interesting. Um, right. So what is has, life? What is death? You know, the yin yang of politics, science, and yeah. spirituality, and so on. So there's a lot, yeah. of, a lot of cool stuff in there. Was this your personal copy that you sent me? No, I just, I, my friend who's in the US, I said, can you just go online and order one yeah. from one of these sellers and send okay. it? Because I, it was it's too funny many. because it has notes in it and it smells of perfume. So I thought, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. That's I think. all right. It smells nice. It's a multi-sensual <laughs> experience reading reading it. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, no. I mean, I recommend it, but it's it's not it's I'm not I'm not really like promoting it because it's I was just told to take all needs away from the project. So if you feel inspired and you want to yeah. read it, please. I'll, it I'll is, link to your Facebook page where people can download it. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty it's an interesting book. Yeah, it's a precursor to what's happening now with me. So it's almost like part of the same story. It's just. A, that was then, and then it continues on yeah. into the next book. But as far as what I would want to say is just that if you could do one thing and one thing only at this time, it would be become to know your inner self, you know, know thyself, ask the question, the great Ramana Maharshi, right? Who am I? What am I? And then sit. It's it's not just meditation, it's contemplation, meaning that you're questioning and question everything. You know, if you have a limitation, I want to know, is this limitation, what, do I really need to have, you know, question who you are, what you are, what this world is, and you will start having experiences that will show you a more expanded awareness. And at that point, things that you need will just show up. Yeah. And you'll get ideas. So if if you try to attack it from a third dimensional kind of dualistic way of racking your brain trying to figure it out like what am i going to do it lowers your energy to such a level that you cannot attract 
and you cannot receive what you need because you're at such a dense, heavy level. I don't care if it's just like you're going on Facebook and saying these negative things, pull that in, take the time to get to know your inner being. You have a soul, which is the infinite part of yourself and it is guiding you. It's right there with you. It knows exactly what you need and and also what you want. Because we did come to play individual. We, we came to play a divine spark. It, it's not meant to be, well, because because some people negate the human experience. And and I think that they suffer greatly from that. And I, I've seen people suffering greatly from that. And also, then there's people who just completely identify with the body-mind and they don't have any clue. I, I say to people here, like in England or wherever I am, like, they look at me like I'm crazy. What do you mean? Like you're getting guidance. What is this? Like with some Santa Claus in the sky? Like they don't, they just don't know. <laughs> they don't know that they have an inner being, a, a higher self. And then also they don't understand the laws of physics of you can intend something and you can visualize it. And if you're aligned, it'll come. It, it, they have absolutely no idea. And they're just completely lamenting. Oh God, I'm so afraid. And it's like, I just want to say, just stop and go to the park and sit in the park and, and bring peace to yourself. And that affects the whole world. One person, one being who's vibrating, they say like, uh, I don't know if you ever read David R. Hawkins, Power Versus Force, when he calibrated all this energy, but one being like a Buddha or a Jesus or a Paramahansa or Ananda, who emanates a frequency of unconditional love overrides millions of others who are at a more hypnotized, denser level so it's not all energy is created equally. So if you want to be one of those beings who affects this critical mass that's happening, then please, please do that. And you, your personal needs will be, you will have what you need and you will also have what you want because you'll be more free to, wow, I want to be an artist. I can be an artist. You know, I want to be a musician. I can be a musician or an actor or whatever, a writer, just do it. That's the other message. Just do it. If you want to write, write. If you want to dance, dance. Don't wait to be like, well, how am I going to make money? Forget that. Just just do the thing. So that's my message. <laughs> just be who you are and who you are as a human and also who you are as a soul. Well, that's a great synopsis. Very eloquent. Thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah, so thanks so much. Ah, so uh, we'll stay in touch and uh, look forward to hearing what your next book is about when you, when you finish it. Um, yeah. and I already have a sense of what it's about. I bet you it's going to be good. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So um, people can go to your Facebook page, obviously. That's probably the best way to get in touch with you if they want I to. I have a, a website, and it, it's under construction, and that website is going to be elizabethannhill.com, but it's completely under construction right now. Okay. So Let me know when it's up, and I'll add it yeah. to, you, to the show notes. Right. But if you go to um, facebook.com slash twin souls 444, that's my, my author page where yeah. I you can get download the different things. And I have a personal page. You can find me. I, I actually kind of share most of my journey on my personal page. Mm. I'll link and to them both if you want. Yeah. And then just, you know, as of now, that's all I'm using. But now I'm kind of moving back into having, I didn't, you know, into having more of a, a present, yeah. more of a presence, you know, but that's just because the journey has kind of shifted. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I would love for you to go to my author page and give me a like and give me a follow because as we know, that generates more and yeah. all of that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, right, thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a great, great conversation, I think. Yeah, I really enjoyed, enjoyed it. it. And it's been fun preparing for it, too, listening to all, all the stuff. And, and um, if people go online and search for your name, they'll find some other things they can listen to. And I'll, I'll link to that, um, what was it, Conversation with the Universe, you called it? Yeah, an interview yeah. with the universe. Interview with the universe, yeah. Three, three too. recordings, yeah, and then I had some interviews um, with my friend Lisa Bonis. In fact, I did, she works for the Shift Network, and I just did another interview with her just before this one, and that is going to air in October. On the Shift uh, Network? Yeah, on the Shift Network. Oh, that's Network. huge, great. Yeah, it's called um, Beyond the Veil Summit, and I'm one of the people. Oh, yeah, so I saw that, that summit uh, thing, yeah. Yeah, so things are starting to you know, come together as far as sharing. Cause that's really what I want. I mean, that's, I didn't go through all this just for myself. I, wanted yeah, to share, so. I was just going to say, you know, you might as yeah. well, yeah. After all this, yeah. you, you want to share it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, well thanks. Thank and, you, Rick. Yeah. You're welcome. And thanks to those who've been listening or watching and, um, 
We'll see you for the next one. And I said, as I said in the beginning, um, if you want to be notified of f- subsequent interviews, either sign up, you know, subscribe on YouTube or um, uh, subscribe on batgap.com to the email notification thing. And there's also an audio podcast subscription page there in case you like to listen to audio podcasts of the show. All right. See you next time. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you so much. Take Bye-bye, care. everybody. Keep on trucking.